Thank you. <clears throat> and it's a pleasure to introduce a speaker who has actually been on our list of potential speakers since the very beginning. Um, Monica uh, did her PhD in quantum chemistry in Budapest before moving to University of uh, Southern California to do a postdoc uh, uh, using computational approaches to study enzyme catalysis. Then she had a, a series of stints as a visiting fellow at the, the Weizmann Institute and the Laboratory of Molecular Biology uh, in Cambridge before becoming a <clears throat> full professor at, uh, uh, at the University in Depression in 2012, where she has stayed until 2020, where she moved to Italy, to Padua, which is close to the mountains, close to the, close to the, the, the beach and has good food, as she, she just uh, uh, reminded us all. Uh, so, a good place to be invited to, I think. Um, so Monica uh, uses computational approaches and develops computational tools uh, to study uh, primarily fuzzy interactions. Or at least that that is what I think your your name has become almost uh, synonymous with. Uh, so we are very interested to hear what's uh, what's new in the ID interactions. So please, Monica, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, I hope you can see my screen now. Yeah, can you see? Yeah, looks good. Okay, so again, thank you very much for the invitation. I will talk about three things today. What was known, what's new, and what was known, but we were not aware. Okay, <laughs> these are the three things. So we knew that some proteins uh, adopt into a well-coded structure of unbinding. And some of these um, pre-organized elements may be present in the unbound state, even before the transition state. We also kind of knew that the functional consequences of having such element is kind of controversial. So in some cases, it really helps binding or any kind of activity. Whereas in other cases, it might be something that compromises activity. And I'm showing an example for that in P27, which would benefit actually from having kind of the stabilized helix. And this is what you see here. Once you increase the helical stability, you also uh, compromise the inhibitory activity. We also knew that there are proteins that don't want to fold upon binding and they kind of exhibit so-called disordered binding. For example, proteins forming pre-initiation pre complex for two, they basically remain disordered or conformationally heterogeneous in their bound form. These are transcription factors, which are also denoted as like acidic blobs because there is an accumulation of charges. We also knew quite, quite a lot actually about the binding characteristics. And here I might read the, the time. 91, okay, before the whole IDP field emerged. So the example I'm using here, it's binding of tau to microtubules. And you can see the characteristic described in the paper. So they observed the kind of length dependent binding. It's kind of a stepwise binding. So you have a kind of a change if you start truncating it, then stable, then a change again. So it's kind of stepwise and you can see it depends on the number of repeats and it's not cooperative. And even more, the binding had been described in kind of molecular term. And this is, although it's a cartoon, but I think it's very important what we are going to discuss today. So disordered binding means that you sample multiple binding configurations. So this was the cartoon for tau. You see that it can bind in this way, or it can bind in this way, or converging to the bound form. And probably all these forms are sampled in the, in the course of binding. And as a third piece of evidence, we also knew that evolvability might be selection criteria. What does it mean? That some processes, for example, embryonic development, requires a large degree of flexibility of processes. Okay, that means that the constraints on many different biochemical properties have to be reduced in order to accumulate non-lethal variations. So what does it mean in kind of more practical terms? It means, and I'm using all the examples from the original paper, again, 98, that there are weak constraints 
on binding or associations. So these processes include regulation of cellular processes like gene expression, cell cycle, even carbohydrate metabolism, big linkages like coupling between different processes, exploratory processes like cytosevental morphogenesis or T-cell receptor activity, and also compartmentation, for example, along specification process. So all of these require some kind of weak constraints on binding rather than or kind of traditional way of thinking about it. Okay, so the first take home message, this is what we knew for a long, long time before even the IDP field emerged, that there are wide range of binding modes from order to disordered binding because of the biological logic, because of the flexibility of processes. So we knew if we arrange these binding modes along the spectrum or on the scale of entropy, uh, we can say that we knew quite a lot about this when entropy decreases upon binding. This is ordered binding. This is when you get a well-defined uh, binding pattern. And we knew quite a lot about also disordered binding, which doesn't only include disordered proteins. Many ordered proteins unfold upon binding, for example, increasing entropy. Okay, and this unfolding is important for the given function. Okay, so we knew quite a lot about both ends of the spectrum. However, we knew very, oops. Okay, however, we knew very little about the middle of the spectrum, which is neither blue, neither orange. So this kind of ambiguous, very strange color of limeish, greenish something. When proteins, don't have an, an ambiguous type of binding, okay? Uh, they can have kind of changes in the binding mode. So what we, just to cut it short, what we have not realized that proteins may actually move along the spectrum. And this will be very important for my talk today, okay? This kind of movement is called context-dependent binding. What it means, uh, let me illustrate using uh, glycogen synthase kinase 3, which is an important enzyme in carbohydrate metabolism, as well as in regulation of mitogenic pathways. So this has a disordered end terminus. In the wind pathway, it remains to be disordered upon binding axon, whereas in the insulin pathway, in contrast to what we see here, a small piece, a very small piece at the end terminus falls upon binding. So what would you say from the sequence? Is it ordered binding or disordered binding? Well, it's a context-dependent binding. Depending on the pathway, you get a different binding mode. So if you kind of translate it to the language of structure-function relationship, what it means, it's not only a structural heterogeneity when you bind. More importantly, it means that you obtain different functionalities upon binding, depending on the context. It will also mean, I may not elaborate it very well today, that the sequences might be more tolerant to, to changes upon binding, because the requirements, as I said before, the, there are weak restraints for this, uh, let's say, binding constraints. So the question is, why proteins uh, develop such kind of uh, you know, context-dependent binding mode? But what we need to look at, and this question has not been really asked uh, many times, whether this scenario, uh, folding upon binding, disorder to order, is a favorable one. We always consider structures favorable, right? So our concepts basically are these ones. But indeed, if you look at it, if you analyze energetically what's going on, and here we use the energy landscape framework in collaboration with Peter Bulliness, we found for about 100 protein complexes for which we had experimental evidence to be disordered in the unbound state, and as well as experimental evidence to be, I mean, folded in the bound form, we found that these are suboptimal, energetically frustrated. This is the density of frustrated contacts. So basically, for a large number of complexes with experimental evidence, we had demonstrated that these are energetically not optimal, okay? Even though they bind, even though they fold. So what we can say in general 
that frustration for folding somehow relates to frustration during binding. So basically, sequences that can fold, they have very low degrees of frustration upon binding, but sequences that don't want to fold, they also exhibit high degree of frustration upon binding. So basically, sequences that are not compatible with folding, they won't be compatible even with folding upon binding, or they fold, but they won't be energetically optimized. What's the kind of meaning of this? Let's say you take a protein, a translation initiation factor, you form two complexes, okay? On the two triangles, you see contact maps for the two different complexes. And what you just need to kind of observe or inspect, these are the red dots. The red dots um, basically represent energetically frustrated contacts. The green ones are neutral. And what you can observe here that both of them, and you see the structures here. So both of them have red dots. So both of them have, you know, suboptimal contacts. Both of them are suboptimal. So they will be heterogeneous. At the same time, if you inspect it carefully, you see that the red dots have a different pattern here and have a different pattern here. This is not observable here. This one doesn't appear here and so on. So that means that they are both frustrated, but differently frustrated. So there are different frustration patterns for the different states. Therefore, they are specific, okay? This is similar to what you can achieve with uh, <clears throat> uh, spins of magnets. So you cannot uh, achieve a favorable state for all three of them. You always have one state that is kind of frustrated, okay? Let me try to use kind of a different language to, to illustrate this phenomenon. So let's imagine that a protein sequence is a drone. The drone is underwent the training of the evolution, okay? So then the drone flies. If the conditions are clear, such as here, that although the landscape is rugged and complicated, the drone can fly very close to the surface. This is the world of intramolecular interactions. That means that the protein sequence is a fair knowledge on the partners because these are the other parts of the sequence. So this is the world of native and specific interactions, okay? But at the same time, there is another challenge for our drone, which is the protein sequence, that the drone goes high. And at high, uh, let's say altitude, the situation is fairly different because conditions are not so clear protein partners come and go and spastically appear. And there are many, many, many things can change in the cell. I get talk about it. So the protein sequence has a limited knowledge on the partner. It has some knowledge on specific partners, obviously, but there are many other situations for which the sequence is basically not trained. And this is the word of non-native or generic interactions. And after all, we have one protein sequence and one training process, okay? So this is what we need to understand when we think about these interactions. And if we use, oops, sorry, it's difficult to change the screen. Okay, so if we use the energy landscape framework, that means to be prepared for all these different cases, the protein keeps non-native interactions, even in its native state, okay? So even it was shown for myoglobin in late 60s that myoglobin has this non-native state, which are mostly used for regulation of activity in, at low concentrations, but at high concentrations, these are the interactions that stabilize high order states, okay? So the second take home message is that context dependent binding modes exist actually for most proteins, irrespective if they are disordered or ordered, and they enable multifunctionality. Let me mention here, a note here, that in mathematics, uh, the description, the formalism for context dependence, it's called fuzzy set theory, okay? So it's a field in mathematics. Now, considering this uh, context dependent behavior, so how, we would describe an interaction between two proteins. Mostly we ask, is it ordered or disordered complex? That's the question for many years. I hope you had understood from my message that 
you don't ask just an interaction, you ask an interaction behavior. So this has three components, more or less. One is whether it's good or disordered, but to what extent, okay? The second is if it has a bound structure, so it's folded, I mean, what kind of bound structures we have? There might be the same helix. I, I know secondary structure variations have been described, but there might be the very same helix having some kind of different orientation. And this might be very important for droplet formation, for example. And the third question is the binding modes. So how many different contexts behave, context dependent behavior a protein complex can exhibit? What kind of variation we observe in this kind of order disordered binding? So we have to, I always teach my students to ask questions properly. And that's the only way to get proper answers. So I guess we had not asked the questions properly for a long, long time, because we had not asked about the interaction behavior. We were just surprised that some proteins behave differently under different contexts. So let me try to answer these questions one by one. Q1, it's ordered or disordered binding mode. What you need to do here is just to look for the local bias that would drive it to ordering. And that means that you are not looking for absolute quantities, absolute compositions. You look for the bias, you can look for differences. In a very few quantities, maybe only two could be enough, local dynamics, composition, and hydrophobicity. If you do that, you basically get a prediction on the degree of ordering on a continuum scale between zero and one. And using my original example of this RSK1 protein, you see that we have two binding sites. One is more ordered than another. It's interesting because it's not the regular structure which is more ordered. And after a while you may understand because it's helix and also some kind of irregular form. In between there must be a linker, okay? But we talk about the degree of ordering here. Then, okay, then the second question, how many binding modes do we have? And let me illustrate this on TDP43, low complexity domain, okay? So here on the X axis, I put all these different uh, binding modes, the extent of ordering. Actually, the scale here goes, it's DD, disorder to disorder, so it's the scale for disordering. And here, I just count the residues and the possibilities, and I can do it very easily on the computer, uh, what would be the probability to sample a certain kind of binding mode, okay? It's, it's a very simple process. So basically here you have a distribution. Uh, I hope you can see my mouse. So here you have a distribution of the different binding modes. On the right side, it's all disordered. Here it's more ordered. And what you can see for TDP43 that most of the residues and under most of the context it, it likes to sample disordered binding mode, so it will form a droplet. But there is a small kind of probability, okay, that it can also go to ordered binding modes. So if I analyze this distribution, the median would give me the binding mode that I would report, let's say, for a residue, okay? But then I also know that there is a binding mode diversity here. So I can compute the information content. It's the Shannon entropy from information theory that is straightforward to compute from this distribution. And then I will know what's the likelihood to change the binding mode. Let me illustrate this. this these, are, these dots, all the dots correspond to residues in the TDP43 low complexity domain. The ones here on the y-axis, you see this binding mode diversity. The dots that are, let's say, light green, they have an increased binding mode diversity. That means they can be disordered. They can be also ordered. And interestingly, these ones form the amyloid core of TDP43. The ones here with blue, they have a very disordered binding, but very low binding mode diversity. So they always want to be disordered binding. So they kind of promote droplet formation. The ones here, they are quite disordered light, but they have a high, uh, drop, uh, high binding mode diversity. So these are the aggregation hotspots for TDP43. Let me illustrate, let, let me make an other illustration, let's say for this approach. 
If you ask about the interaction behavior, okay, you use, we call it a binding landscape approach. So you don't only ask about the binding mode, you ask also about the context dependence. You, you ask about the binding mode diversity, and this is now P53. I think everyone knows P53. So you see that the C-terminal domain really wants to be disordered all the time, okay? Because it has very low binding mode diversity and it's very disordered binding. The oligomerization domain, it's more ordered, but also it can sample multiple binding modes. But the most context dependent sites are the MDM2 binding site and also the DNA recognition helix. So that means that they can sample multiple uh, binding modes upon different contexts. So they are induced, they are the most inducible ones. Okay, so the take home message from this part that the interaction behavior, the behavior itself, considering all the different characteristics can be predicted from the sequence, including the context dependent binding modes. Then you may ask me about the cellular behavior. Like what, what about the interactions in a cell? If the cell situation is pretty dense and pretty stochastic. So that means to cut it short, that the function of a protein will depend on the sequences of other molecules. So there will be some kind of collective behavior behind the functionality of the protein. And here, if we go back to our energy landscape framework, we need to realize that this kind of uh, non-native interaction starts operating. Because at high concentrations, basically, it's not the native state that is uh, sta more stable anymore. It's the amyloid state that is thermodynamically most favorable for all proteins, right? So basically, we, we have to uh, realize that the condensed states are basically the favored one, the thermodynamically favored one uh, for all proteins in the cell. They can be liquid light or they can be solid light. Obviously, the liquid light ones are metastable and everything is heading towards the amyloid state, and the homeostasis system has to work very hard to avoid this. But you have to realize that this is the concentration increase in a cell that shifts protein towards the condensed state. And it's not because many proteins are discovered to undergo liquid-liquid phase separation. It's because of proteins as any other material has three states, okay? So it's a physical necessity that they sample this. Okay, but the question is how then we describe the interactions in the droplet state. So, the main characteristics are they have to be generic. That means that they have to be achievable by all proteins. They must have high entropy because we have a liquid-like state. They must be context dependent because the droplets are modulated by the cellular conditions. That means that the interaction motifs may also change with the cellular conditions, okay? And they have big specificity that we can compute, but I will not talk about it today. So this means you may exhaustively search for motives, but it won't be meaningful because, I mean, you need to find something that, that is applicable for all proteins, basically. Now, let, let, let's go back to this framework. This is the word of non-native interactions, which can be disordered or context dependent. So if we can try this. Let's try to compute disordered interactions and let's see if we get the droplets. And this is what we did. Based on the disordered interactions, we could identify the plate promoting regions for all known um, regions that were identified uh, last year. Okay, this is illustrated for alpha synuclein. You see that the C-terminal region of alpha synuclein can drive droplet formation. However, if you want to uh, predict whether a protein undergoes liquid-liquid phase separation, it's a bit more difficult. And the reason is that some proteins can do standalone, so they can spontaneously phase separate, whereas other needs kind of assistance by other molecules, so they need to interact with other molecules. In the parentheses, you see the kind of number of evidence last year. So I illustrate this on the example of alpha synuclein and beta synuclein. Both of them have this droplet promoting region, but beta synuclein. Uh, requires a bit of temperature increase to phase separate as compared to alpha synuclein, which does it at 20 Celsius. 
So for this, you need to understand that when a protein phase separates, it's not only enough to have a droplet from off in region, but needs some kind of stabilization similar to protein folding, okay? But using these generic interactions. And this kind of stabilizing force can be hydrophobic force also, uh, similarly to protein folding. So when we put this into the algorithm, then we could differentiate between alpha synuclein and beta synuclein. And our work in the, the borderline is 0 0.6 for, for phase separation. I actually suggest to use this test for uh, comparing different algorithms. I think it's a very sensitive test, by the way. Also, gamma synuclein. OK, if you apply this uh, approach, for the whole human proteome, we find that about 40% of the proteins can spontaneously form droplets. There is another additional 45% can be induced to form droplets. And the importance of this prediction is not only that phase separation is widespread in, in human proteome. It must be like that. As I said, it's a physical necessity. What it illustrates that if you use this kind of generic principles, you may be able to recapitulate this physical reality. So the second, I mean, the next take home message is that the droplet state is encoded in these non-native disordered interactions and these generic interactions are widespread in cells. If you want to hear more about it, I have a lecture on YouTube with this title and I, I give the link here. So but still, I mean, I said generic. But you want to know the chemistry, you want to know the particular type of interaction that's operating for your system. But that's not really the way to go as, you know, collecting the zoo of interactions. If you would go to physics, you know, I would rather use a weak interaction of octopole, which doesn't have a name in chemistry. Okay, I used to make the joke that this is only not used because it doesn't have a name. Anyway, so this is making a zoo, it's, it's, not, it's not something that you can go with. <laughs> What you need to do is something else. There, you require some kind of, and this is the hidden knowledge, okay? So we would need high resolution information on the droplet, which is not yet available, but there is a hidden knowledge. So you want to understand, for example, driving forces uh, that drive aggregation from the droplet step. Then trivially, you would look for Chris Dobson, one of the very notable names. And you find all these beautiful papers and you would understand a lot about amyloids. You would not look for this paper, also look at the year 92. So this paper is about bungarotoxin, okay? Assembly of bungarotoxin and modeling. You look at the title, you, wouldn't, you would never ever look at this paper. At the same time, the paper is extremely relevant because the, this describes kind of variation in the interactions, okay, as it assembles, and also distinguishing those residues that can be able to change these interactions in the same way as in the droplet from those that are kind of forming this assembly or promoting this assembly of beta strands, okay? There are many cases like that from the old days when people really did very careful, very tedious analysis of all the structures. So I tried to make an effort to assemble something like 400 of these. Uh, it's not exhaustive, okay, not at all. But these are stoichiometric assemblies in many cases of those regions that form droplet and provide a high resolution structural information. It's extremely valuable what you can read out of this. But my main point here, look at the literature. You will find amazing amount of information before the whole IDP field emerged, okay? And don't live in the realm. Don't, don't live in this, this magic word that interactions in droplet are different from specific assemblies. No, they are exactly very much the same. And I can show you a series of analysis on this. And you can learn. Once you believe this, you will immediately have the kind of rules of thumb, how are the interactions in the droplets? And these are, as I said, very context dependent, very variable interactions. And this context dependence can be described by a mathematical formalism, by fuzzy sets, simply describing the, the variation interactions. 
And for some fun, a few years ago with some mathematician friends, we actually made this proposal that droplets like AI devices, okay? And we, in what we did that we took the control algorithm of one of these machines that work in a warehouse and not only sort out the goods, but also compute in a way, uh, kind of optimal packing. So we took the control algorithm and what we did was that we use it for simulation of droplets. We could simulate droplet formation and also dependence on sequence. We could simulate aggregations. These are from our simulations. We could also simulate something that kind of prevents aggregation. For us, it was a fun, okay? It was just kind of proof of principle that this fuzzy formalist can work. But what I'm making the point is that it's not an utopy, okay? You, we just need quantitative uh, ways, mostly for the terms and concepts to work with these systems and to, to understand and to elaborate the most exciting thing to put forward the state function paradigm to interpret protein function in the cell. So with this, I would like to thank in particular Michele Vendroscolo with whom I did almost all this work. So it's kind of, I would say, co-authoring this with me. And also Martin uh, from his group who did the experiments uh, probing or predictor. Uh, I also particularly grateful to Hao Wu from Harvard uh, with her, we wrote a review about five years ago, which I really recommend to read because it provides a kind of overview on the continuum of different higher order assemblies, which I think is quite important if you want to understand a particular uh, space out of this. Um, with Peter Bullenes and the team from Buenos Aires, we applied this and landscape framework to, uh, and uh, you know, analyzed the frustration in different complexes. Attila is a mathematician. He proposed to use the Shannon entropy for binding mode diversity. Chabanta developed the fast, uh, Fred fast drop server. And um, uh, Silvio's group helped me in uh, renewing the fast DB, not curating, curation was done by me, but uh, kind of the outlook. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>